Actually, it's the it's the lead play in our in our offense. We ask our YN or a tight end to open up somewhere between six feet and nine feet. To get an isolation with the with the linebacker. Tell the tackle to take the defensive end if he's over him. If he's not, to drive down on the first man to his inside. If the YN has the linebacker taken out. What's up, guys? Welcome into Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. Find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. Email us, Packers Total Access at gmail.com. Text us, 865-658-5824. Joining alongside Tim, live in Green Bay. We got Emilio in Tennessee back here this evening to talk Packers. Just don't don't check the, the text thread there, guys. It's going to get everybody laughing here. So, anyway, uh, I know the chat's already lit up. Let's give a shout out to some of these folks in here. Probably can't hit on all of them. We got United Bates, Margin Cron, Omer in the house, Andres, Eric Sutherland, M. Smitty Deadfish, uh, Ron Samble. Let's see, Mark Zambito. Did I say Eric Sutherland? I think I did, didn't I? Greg, Prince, the whole crew is in the house tonight. Blake B., good to see you, buddy. Coach Lynn in the house, Mr. Larry, everybody, and Chris in, Dan, Dan G., what's up, buddy? Good to see you in here. Um, let's just go uh, – well, actually, before we go to the chat, let's do a quick uh, shout-out to our sponsor tonight, and that is Ticket King, the official ticket provider of Packers Total Access Live, Wisconsin-based since 1992, specializing in Packers tickets, Wisconsin's largest ticket source. They've got offices next to Lambeau Field as well as in Milwaukee. You can click on the link in this video description, and that will send you to theticketking.com where you can register for free as a customer and have yourself in the system ready to go for when that May schedule release hits, obviously right around the corner here next month they're going to be able to save you some money on packers tickets that's what they specialize in again they are the official ticket provider of packer fan total access that is the ticketking.com we appreciate them supporting the show um so let's go to the chat real quick first of all omer another night of omer complaining about mock drafts he says only 15 more days of mock drafts left tick tock tick tock then we can get ready to look at our new guys and get ready for rookie camp can't wait and then, of course, Ron Samble says, Mike Wall likes mock drafts almost as much as home air. <laughs> you guys missed that interview earlier today. Go back and watch it where uh, Mike Wall came on and, and just kind of cut up with us a little bit and talked a little ball, got a, got a little bit of information out of him about some of these prospects that he he likes and, and maybe doesn't like. But, God, it's hilarious. Anytime you get Mike on, man, he's a hoot. It doesn't matter where the source of information is. It's wrong. That's what I love about Mike. Like, mm-hmm. Did you, did you hear me say, Amelia, I know you listened to it. I said, you don't like PFF, do you? And he went, well, you know, I was like, is he coming around to PFF? Next time we talk to him, he'll go, PFF's trash. Yeah, uh-huh. That's exactly it. And he'll be like, ah, no, not not for me. But uh, great interview, man. I love love when Mike gets on, man, because we learn every, we learn more than – more than what we we probably spill out in a week, I would think, in, in Mike's you know forty minute interview. So I appreciate it for sure. No doubt. What I love about Mike too is he's former O lineman. He he'll dish it out. He'll have fun with it. Like he, he just it's like you're having having a beer with one of the guys. You know what I'm saying? Like it, he doesn't try to be over professional and everything. He doesn't try to sound act like a know it all. He just gives his perspective. Um, just a, just an overall great dude, man. The fact that he takes the time to come on here and, and share some of what he's learned there over the course of whatever it was, 11 years in the league, I believe it was, however many years it was that he spent in the league there with Green Bay, Carolina. Um, just a really cool story. So, uh, yeah, um, let's see what else we got in the chat here real quick. Um, Blake B says, Edrian Cooper is this year's Darnell Washington going to us in every mock but I have a feeling it'll be a totally different linebacker. He goes on to say, I'm feeling Junior Colson. I know when we talked with Mike earlier today, I tried to ask his opinion from, you know, from like an offensive lines perspective, right? Like what, what do you think makes a good linebacker? You're the guy who has to stop them, right? Whether it's in the run game or, or if they try to fire on a blitz or you, you recognize, okay, we got to build a game plan around a guy like a uh, Ray Lewis or someone like that. Right. Which he played, played against, I'm sure numerous times. 
And uh, it was just cool to kind of get his perspective. It, to me, I came away, and Emilio, you correct me if, if I'm wrong here. Did you feel like – Tim, did you get a chance to listen to the interview? I, I figured I did you not. Were, yeah, that's all I did cool. not. Um, I, I feel like Junior Colson was his favorite linebacker. Did you kind of – it's either him or Peyton Wilson. Do you agree, Emilio, just based off what he said there? Yeah, I, I think so. And, I mean, he like, like he said, uh, what are we grading linebackers off 40 times now? So right. I think he was I think he was more in tune of what Junior Colson was putting on the film, you know, putting on the field because that eye in the sky doesn't lie. Right. You can you can run fast on a day and be all right. But um, to, to do it, you know, week in, week out, I think he did, you know, for sure, like Colson more. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, so I, I kind of feel like we're on to something there with Junior Colson. You know, right. I know my board, it's my favorite linebacker. And I know the Holy Spirit team is kind of high on him. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it could, I mean, it could be another Quay situation though. Right. But this, this time we actually kind of know about him. Everyone's been mocking Edrin Cooper. Everyone's been mocking Peyton Wilson if he falls, but mm -hmm. Goody might reach and take that, the guy that was supposed to be in the second, third round, but he had a, you know, top 10 grade on him. Right. Watch Goody not even take a linebacker. Wouldn't that be hilarious? Right. Yeah. Not one That's single it. linebacker in the whole draft, Tim. Wouldn't it? That would be so hilarious. No, that would not be hilarious. <laughs> I, would, I would not laugh at all. The one thing I did like that Mike was saying was the fact that if you're playing linebacker, I need you to throw up 20 reps at least. I would think on on 225. And I, you know, I need you to. Right. You're going to have to stop a 300 pound dude half the time in, in your face, especially being a Mike. And I, that's what he. That's what I like. What he said about uh, you know, McDuffie. He's ready to roll. Mm -hmm. he's, he's played, you know, he's played Mike. He's not afraid to blow up a block. He's not afraid to stick his nose in there versus these kids coming out of college. They haven't, you know, they've been playing against obviously that weight and stuff, but the, the skill, the speed, the power of the, you know, the elite in the NFL is different. Yeah, for sure. And Doug pointed in the chat said, does anyone think Cooper is a true mock linebacker? I haven't heard anyone specifically say that. I know the 33rd team, I'm almost positive that they they have him as a will, I believe, or maybe he was so low that I didn't recognize it. Let me hop over there and check real quick, um, and see exactly where they've got him at because I know the the top Call three. Him a will. What's that? They've got, they've got him listed as a will. Okay, you got um, it. Perfect. On thirty third team. Yep. Yep. So they I haven't seen anyone list him as a true mock, right? So and that's what it's going to come down to is like if they go and they and they draft a will, then it means Quay's going to be playing mock. If they go draft a the mock, then it means Quay's going to be playing Will, right? And it's cool to have that versatility. And I love what what Mike said there too in the interview. Um, he, you know, I kind of asked, you know, what changes do you expect with the four three defense, and and maybe how that's going to come along. And he said, the game has changed now. Uh, Quay can be unlocked in the four three, and that's what you're looking for. And for him to truly get unlocked, it, it's going to be him in that Will spot. And like he said, you know, if you're going to play him at mock, they did that last year. And it really didn't suit his strengths, right? You want him to be able to play free, play half the field, and be able to to run down some of those cutback lanes as well as blitz occasionally, that type of thing. So, um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll kind of see how that unfolds when we get into training camp, especially. I'm eager to see too, like when they get into their off season program, if any hints come out of where he may or may not be playing, right? Like they're going to be, you know, kind of coming in and, and doing some stuff, some off season activity here on the 15th. I don't think anything will be unveiled there, but I will be keeping an ear to the streets, right, <laughs> to try to figure out what are they thinking with Quay this year in a 4-3, because I think it is going to be very interesting. Now, something else that he said, Tim, I asked him, I said, hey, what's um, <clears throat> what do you think makes a good linebacker in a 4-3 defense, right? And, uh, and, I, and I say 4-3, this could also refer to inside linebackers in a 34 but, you know, we're talking about those stack backers, essentially. And the thing that he said is you've got to be able to get off of blocks. You've got to be a good tackler. He said be the hammer, not the nail. And also you've got to have speed. And he, and he went on to correct himself, not correct himself, but add to that. Now, speed also means FBI, football intelligence, right? So when you talk about football intelligence, that seems to be a positive with Peyton Wilson, right? Uh, that's definitely one of the things on his scouting report. So that kind of makes you step back a second and go, hmm, can, will someone try to make him a mock, although the 33rd team has him as a will, right? So uh, mm -hmm. that'll be interesting there as well. Um, so that's what he said made 
a great linebacker in his in his eyes, you know, from an offensive line's perspective. Um, so we need to kind of dig in a little bit and see who matches those profiles. You know what I mean? Because it'll it'll stick out like a sore thumb when you look at the scouting reports. Maybe we can wrap up the show with doing that if we uh if we have time there. Um, let's see what else we got in the chat real quick. I know you're gonna love this one, Tim. Coach Lynn in the chat said, "I'm starting to really like Rake Straw from Mizzou." Said uh, the more I watch him, so um, that is that is definitely Tim's guy. Um, let me pull him up here on the board here on my board. Here's the guy. <laughs> let's see if we can find him real quick. Um, I've got him in the 34 spot, so pretty high. And really, the only thing that pulled him down was his PFF grade in uh, 2022. So if you were to X that out of the equation. Honestly, he probably would jump up to Kali, probably a score in the 30s, which would put him, I mean, that would put him as high as somewhere in the top 25, you know. So the only thing, like I said, that really pulled him down was the 2022 PFF grade there. Do you have that grade handy by chance, Emilio? 2022, he was a 77 even uh, with 725 snaps. Last year, he was at 80.7 with 465 snaps. PFF mm-hmm. has him at 42. Got it. And at the time, um, yeah, and at the time that I took the information down, again, we took it before the Underwear Olympics, um, <laughs> he was on the consensus big board at 47. So 34 to 47, somewhere in that range. Daniel Jeremiah has him in the 17 spot on his top 50, his early top 50 list. So that was cool um, to kind of see him fall there. Or I'm sorry, he's got him 24th. The 33rd team has him in the 17 spot. So – that's where Enos Rake Straw is. So, out of all DBs uh, on Draft Buzz right now, they have him at he. They have him sixth out of all the DBs uh, with only Terry and Arnold, Quinion Mitchell, Nate Wiggins, Kool Aid, Cooper, and then it would be Ennis. So wow. he's yeah, I've got him. I've got him above Cooper Dejean. Don't don't tell any Packer fans. To, <laughs> it is listed higher on my board, but yeah. So you talking about the six six best corner? Is that what you're saying, Emilio? No, this is DBs for defensive back rankings on on Draft Buzz. Um, they have them at a, a eighty seven point two with the with Terry and Arnold being eighty eight point seven. So it's not like he's far off, right? Gotcha. So if I include the DBs on my board, he would be one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's see here, be the sixth, seventh. I have him as the seventh best DB, so that's right there in that ballpark. Yeah, so I like draft balls too. I like their. I have him at five, so (laughs) that makes sense. You got him fifth overall. I got him fifth on mine, but you know I'm I'm amongst the amongst corners. You're talking about right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, amongst corners. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I think that's. I think it's very reasonable. I mean, he he's literally, he's in the 33 spot on mine. It says 34, but there's a placeholder. So he's in the 33 spot. In the 32 spot is Tyler Newb, and in the 31 spot is Terry and Arnold. Um, so, I mean, they're right there together. They would be considered the same tier, really just about the same exact grade, to be honest with you. So mm-hmm. um, that's kind of where he sits with mine. Um, good stuff, though. Yeah, so, Tim, you're uh, you're starting to build a, build a little fan base here for Ennis Rake Straw Jr. Right. And it looks, <laughs> looks like they had their overall at 30, uh, 35 on their total board. So, I mean, the – Tim, we, we could snag him in the first, Tim. That that is that one hundred percent a possibility. It, it yeah, in theory, but we we know how uh, our GM likes to operate. I do do we really see him using a first round pick on a corner this year? I mean, if this would be the year to do it, right? I just I don't know. I got a <laughs> feeling we're going to see D line and O line before we see uh, corner or linebacker in this draft. Yeah. He may fool all of us and take a receiver. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's another that's another hilarious scenario. The first yeah. year in a decade that no Packer fans are talking about taking a wide receiver in the first round. He takes mm-hmm. one in the first round. <laughs> it would be so funny, dude. Uh, Jesse Robbins in the chat says, I think Goody is going to go with someone to protect love if the value is there. I would not be surprised at all. We, we've seen it several times where tackles have dropped mm-hmm. to uh, – to the Packers in those situations. Amarius Mims being one, he's 21 on my board. Um, another one, uh, Fontana has never dropped to the best of my knowledge. There was someone else up here that dropped. Uh, J.C. Latham in one of our mocks someone was able to get. Was that you, Tim, or was that – I'm trying to think of who uh, that was. 
Jacob got it with Jacob. his with his guys in that yeah. snake snake draft with Jake. Gotcha. So JC Latham in the 13 spot will be a dream, in my opinion. You know, um, if he somehow some way falls to the Packers. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, I don't Jacob think got him at 25. That's crazy. Yeah, that's wild. And again, you, you never know what's going to happen with the mocks, and that's why they they are mocks. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. But that's so, why none of us took corners or like we we had no chance in that draft. There was either D line or O line, pretty much. Yeah. yeah, pretty much, man. Since we're kind of talking about offensive line, I was a little blown away at what Mock said in the interview about offensive line. Did you hear what he said about Graham Barton, Emilio? Uh, which part? It basically said, if I understood him correctly, he said, I don't even see him as a guard. He said, I just see him as a center. Right. I, I, and, and that's, could you imagine a six, five center? I mean, right. that dude is a wall, but I, what I liked is, you know, he, I, I think it's the, the, you know, the FBI for Graham Barton. Um, he was, you know, you've played tackle, you know what that, you know what that entails. Pretty sure he's played some snaps at guard as well. And that's where we thought we could slide him in. Oh no, he's okay. So he's strictly played left tackle, but the um, the FBI on that and being able to you know know what's going on with your guard, know what's going on with your tackle, and mm-hmm. only being alone what eight to ten plays. I think Mike said uh, you know solo blocking. If you're a left tackle, you can handle you know mm-hmm. eight reps against you know, blocking someone. Yeah, like Coach Lynn said in the chat, you know we have a six five center in Myers. They they've already proven they like those bigger centers, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they spent a second round pick on Myers. That was one of the great things about him was like, man, this is going to be awesome. It just really hasn't panned out. Now that's another question that kind of got asked in a roundabout way to Mike, and and he seemed to think that that Myers really turned it on there at the end of the year. And it's no big surprise. I think he played better down the stretch than he started the season. It's just every year we it just seems like this happens every year, right? He's right. inconsistent and it's just not living up to that. He did. He did point out our boy in Kansas City. What's his name? The the center. Humphrey. Yeah, he pointed out Humphrey. Did you see the way he looked at the camera? Like, my like Humphrey's a dog, dude. Uh huh. He is a dog. So, um, yeah. I like uh, Cedric Cedric Von Prahn at late later round value. I think at the center position, you know, a true mm-hmm. center. Mm-hmm. Maybe we go dip. We can get depth on O line earlier in the draft. You know, taking a guard or a, or a tackle even, and then we sna- snatch up a. Uh, a center like Von Prahn there, mm-hmm. you know, maybe that's 91 or, uh, you know, 125 range. What, what is Von Prahn? I think 33rd team's got him at like 103rd or something, 104th. I'm just wondering where you think he would go because we've Von- mocked him a few times, I think, already. Yeah, Von Prahn, let me see where he's at on my board here real quick. I know he's a little bit lower. I've got him in the 63 spot. Um, I think he's the third best center, if I remember correct. Yeah, I've got Bo Limmer at the 40 spot. I got Zach Frazier at 37. Then, of course, we got Jackson Powers Johnson at 22, um, which he said something about Zach. He he really spoke high about Zach Frazier. And I don't want to say it caught me off guard, but it was just like, hmm. And then he went on to talk about four-time state champion wrestler, Zach Frazier. He's like, you look across the board. At anyone who's a former wrestler, they make great centers. Like he pointed out, Scott Wells was a great uh, a great wrestler. He pointed I, it might have been Humphrey that he pointed out that was a wrestler too, had a wrestling background. But um, that's another cool little nugget that he dropped in there. So he is really high on Zach Frazier. Again, I've got Zach Frazier as our second best center in the thirty seven spot. If Powers Johnson drops, then that means Zach Frazier is going to drop. It'd be pretty cool if maybe in the second or third round you can you could nab a Zach Frazier, you know what I'm saying, and and be you know pretty well set. You know his PFF grades were solid, solid in 2022. If you want to pull those up, Emilio Zach Frazier from West Virginia, yeah, um, you know, kind of take a look at his PFF grades. I'd like I was to just looking on uh, Draft Buzz. They have uh, JPJ as number one. Zach Frazier would be the second rank center, and then that uh, Cedric Van Pran would be the third. Um, got let me just see where. So they, yeah, see where they got Bo Limmer if you're still there. On um, yeah, centers? Yeah, if you haven't moved on. Let yet. me see. So Bo Limmer, they have him as number four. Hunter Norris at five, and Tanner Bordellini would be six. Um, and it's not like from JPJ, he would uh, he was an 87.4 in their ratings. Zach Frazier was an 85.7, and Van Pram was an 85. Bo Limmer then starts to drop with 82.4. So they're not that far off. 
and and honestly i mean i wrestled for 13 years so it's it like it, it helps you balance flexibility all of that and it's not it, especially playing or you know wrestling at, at that high level there's no one else there it's you and the dude across from you you have absolutely no other chance um you know if, if you lose it's on you if you win it's on you so yeah. um you know that that's big beating the man across from you in the nose but zach frazier for his pff they had him uh 2021 he was a 77.5 2022 he was an 80.8 and then 2023 he was a 77.5 so with 800 snaps over all of those years he yeah. was consistent um another question that i asked mike was um what was which was more difficult to block against the three four or the four three and he said the three, four was right. And that's what I've always heard. I've always heard that they can do more with it out of that front. You've got those guys in your face. You're, you're basically a, a hat on a hat with a five man front and a 34 jam, um, as opposed to a four, three, where you can kind of get, get out front a little bit, but he did go on to say, I, you know, cause I kind of asked, you know, what's the, the positive or whatever to a four, three. And he said, uh, one of the hardest things to handle as a guard in the NFL are, are quick penetrating defensive tackles. And the four three allows you to do that. It allows you to play really fast in that one gap setup, right? And and I think that that this could potentially, like he said, it's kind of a shame that Kenny has uh, has had to play in the thirty four his entire career because we don't really know what we would have as a as a penetrating three technique. And early on, he played nose, you know, which when you're in a thirty four jam, you're basically nose up on the center. And then when you go to your nickel set, you're playing typically a one to a two eye tech on most in most occasions, which is essentially, you know in between the guard and the and the center or on the inside shoulder of the guard. So he never really got a chance to play that one gap penetration um, on, you know, on either side there. So as you can see right here, when we're talking about technique, thank you, Tim, for pulling that up. When you're talking about defensive line technique, when we're talking about a two I or a one tech, you see those numbers over top of each position, the tackle guard, center guard, tackle Y, Y being the tight end. That's just showing you where a defensive lineman is lining up. So Kenny playing early on, a lot of knows he was playing zero to two I for the most part, right? As opposed to a three tech where you're splitting that tackle guard, which he's done a little more of that here lately. But again, in a four three, it's going to be a lot different than a 34. So we'll see how he adjusts to that. Um, maybe it unlocks Kenny a little bit. It just sucks that it's happened in his 29th year, right? So um, 29 years old, going to get old quick, man. It, it sucks, dude. And, and thing too, when you draft a player young, you go, oh, yeah, man, you're going to get him for longer. It's still football wear, right? That means Kenny, as a 29-year-old, is going to have a lot more wear than a 24-year-old. You know what I mean? Um, just, you know, obviously you're not dealing with the the whole age thing, but you are dealing with the wear for sure. So, um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see what happens there. But I thought it was cool that he he mentioned that about uh, penetrating D-tackle. That was really the hardest part to, to kind of handle there. Um, the other thing he mentioned right off the top, and I don't know if you heard that, Emilio, he said uh, – you, you lost your two best players on the entire team in Aaron Jones and David Bakhtiari. And he said, I don't know if you want to get into that or not. And I went, no, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to talk. I'm done talking. I'm tired of talking about it. Right. Yeah. But uh, I mean, it, when Mike Wall says you lost your two best players, you lost your two best players in Aaron Jones and David Bakhtiari. Now there's some people that come in and say, well, David Bakhtiari hasn't played in the last, you know, two years. That's a good point. That's a good point. You know, it, 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 it's just, when you can have arguably the best left tackle in the game when he's healthy, it's hard to move on from him, right? But I think the time was right. I think it was time to move on. And uh, I, the more time goes by that we haven't heard anything from him, it kind of feels like it may be getting further and further out of reach as far as coming back, you know, playing this year. So, but anything else you guys want to hit on before we uh, turn the page and get, in, get into something else here? No. no. You got anything, Amelia? No, no, it was good. it was a good interview. Go listen to it. Definitely. I got to I got to catch up. It was very up. entertaining. It was very Yeah, oh yeah. No, Mike <laughs> Mike wasn't holding back and he he started I thought he was going to pull out the picture of Clayton eating his last meal like but I wasn't <laughs> sure if he had access to that one so It, it was funny is when we're when we're not live it's just as good. I'm right. telling you man, the conversation it, it's cool to see him get more and more I don't want to say comfortable. He don't care what anybody thinks about him. That's what I appreciate and respect about Mike, but He's getting more comfortable with the con us having conversations, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, the uh, 
the whole 33rd team comment though was like why, why are you focus on the 33rd team what did i say amelia what i rebuttal with yeah I, he said i i don't know what what else is there yeah what do you recommend he yeah. went, i mean i ain't really guys yeah like, okay gotcha and then uh, you know, and I, he, I said the reason i look to it's because it's former former coaches former execs that's been in the league and he oh so you got a bunch of guys that that got fired and suck at their job and I was I, I didn't have the heart to say I didn't have the heart to say no Mike we're talking about Hall of Famer Bill Parcells we're talking about Hall of Famer Bill Polian we're talking about Super Bowl champion you know this coach that coach um, I just let it go <laughs> but it was just hilarious man because that's Mike dude one thing about Mike he's authentic you're gonna you're gonna know exactly where he stands right and dude I yep. we need more of that. We need more of that in this world. That's that's for damn sure. So, um, yeah, yeah. But Coach Lane got it too. So Mike, Mike caught you off guard with that one. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Really, I was like, man, we go. All right, we going this route. Okay, right, right. And what? And there's nothing wrong. I mean, he he has his take. Let him have his take. Right. He Absolutely. Yeah. Professional offensive lineman. Let him eat. And then, <laughs> like what I love, what I did like about it. Yeah. He's like, dude, if I walk into a room and I'm I'm in a room with another offensive lineman, I'll tell you right then if he's got it or not. Yeah. Like, exactly. Yes, you 100% will, Mike. I do not doubt that in a, the slightest. Yeah, no doubt, man. He, uh, he, I, I love to, I asked him about, uh, coach, and I, I I'm going to butcher his name again, but, you know, the coach that passed away, the old, uh, old line coach that Mark Towser was really close to and everything. What did Mike say? I mean, I'll be honest with you. I didn't, we didn't have a close relationship. Right. Like he essentially said we probably didn't see eye to eye, mm -hmm. but hey, I, I I appreciated the fact that he would never put you in a situation that you couldn't handle as an offensive lineman. Some right. coaches go, all right, you need to get to this point, and it's it's just damn near impossible. And then you come back to the meeting room, and they go, hey, why didn't you hit your mark? I told you I couldn't hit that mark, like it's impossible. Mm -hmm. He said that you know some of those coaches there in the early two thousands were really good about understanding that, and he even talked about Mike Sherman in that regard one of the first times that we spoke as well. Um, if you guys didn't watch a whole lot of Packer football in the early 2000s, man. Go, especially like 2000, 2002, 2003, when Amon Green was just running. They were running 22 power eye and the U, you know, U71 bacon down people. So it was a lot of fun, man. Brett was just. Yeah, he not only rambled, but he rumbled and stumbled. <laughs> First ballot Hall of Famer Brett Favre was just dropping back, handing that ball off every play. Just saying, mm -hmm. keep pounding it, keep pounding it. You had a uh, God, who was the other one? Was it uh, Najee Davenport, fullback? Oh, he yeah. was, and and when I said that to him, I said, "No, Najee was more of a power back, right?" And the first time me and Mike spoke, he was, "Oh, Najee was a track star, like he was almost as fast as I'm on." But when you wow. see him run, dude, he was a, he was a hoss. He was a mm -hmm. so really cool. Uh, Kind of look back on some of those uh, those gap plays, and and he said there was times that they would run six, seven plays in a row that was the same play, just run it again, run it again. Mike Sherman just telling run it again, just run it right down their throat, man. Didn't have to worry about comms issues. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Again, yeah, um, same one. Running. Yeah, you're putting them on. No, the Brett, team. don't change it. Don't change it, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. No audibles. <laughs> exactly. Like Andy Monday says here in the chat, the Packers had over 2,500 yards rushing in 2003. I mean, it was just they were, it was unbelievable watching them run the rock, man. Um, let's see this. We've got a quick video from Packers.com on Kenny Clark and the pass rush. We were just talking about probably should have keyed it up while we were talking about Kenny, but I don't want it to pass us by here. They tweeted it out earlier, so you can watch it for free on Twitter on their YouTube channel. Make sure you go give it a like and a share and everything. Again, this is put out by Packers.com. Just talking about Kenny as they uh, they they're out embarking on the uh, tailgate tour right now. Of course, they left earlier today, but uh, let's hear from uh, Packers.com about Kenny Clark. Scrambles right, he's hit it sack. Preston Smith on the sack. Scrambles left now, he's hit and thrown down again. Preston Smith this time makes the hit. Garoppolo under pressure, and he's hit it sack. Back outside the 45 yard line. Play action back to throw Young under pressure. Yes. Hit a sack. Preston Smith. All looking around. Tight pocket. Oh, hit. Ball comes loose. Preston Coming Smith forced it loose. Prescott hit from behind. Preston Smith. Down he goes. Rush on. Looking, waiting. Under pressure. Scrambling left. Go. Where to go. He sacked. Back inside the San Francisco 40. Preston Smith. 
Preston Smith delivered in the playoffs to lead the team in postseason sacks. And he's got a fellow game wrecker in eight-year vet Kenny Clark. Over the last five seasons in Green Bay, this defensive duo has combined for 65 sacks, with both players now ranking top 10 on the Packers' all-time sacks list. He takes, looks, he's hit, and he's sacked! Kenny Clark erases the quarterback! Former first-rounder Kenny Clark is coming off arguably his best season to date, recording career highs in sacks and tackles for loss. Kenny Clark just overpowered his man! could argue he's been our most consistent performer on that side of the ball throughout the course of the season and you can always bank on the fact that you're going to get his best effort. Really proud about how I played you know moving around this year and playing a lot of the five adjusting to that and uh, you know proud about how you know I led this team and just looking forward into the future knowing that we got something good knowing that we that I got something to build off of and excited about what we can do. So playing like a lot of the five, playing a lot of the five, having to adjust to that. You hear that? Yep. It's exactly what you were talking about, Clayton. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, what he's referring to with the five tech there, playing on the outside shoulder of the tackle. I mean, that was – you would never have seen that in the early stages of this 34 defense. It just shows you how much they tried to evolve last year and put him in a position to play a little bit different role. Um, I'm eager to see, man, what he does in his 4-3. I just want to. I want him to get the guy a ring. I wish we could have got Aaron Jones a ring, yeah, but yeah. I really want to see him get Kenny a ring, man. Because he is he's the longest tenured player now, right? Am I thinking right? You've been on the team the longest now. I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, I think you would have to be eight year. Yeah. So, see if we can get old ninety seven a ring before he decides to hang it up I feel here. Feel that way about Preston Smith too, though. At the top yeah. of that video, you just see, mm-hmm. you know, you talk about consistency. I think, uh, you know, KC for sure and uh, and Preston Smith, man, those guys are super consistent um, when they're out in the field, you know. So uh, yep. he, he'd be on that that short list of guys you really want to see get a ring. Obviously, we all want – we want to see them all get one. Um, but uh, definitely a guy like Kenny Clark who's, uh, you know, certainly put in his time. This is a big year for him career-wise too. This is kind of a, a pivotal year going into this new uh, – Jeff Halfley's system and being a contract year. So uh, yeah. let's see what uh, what happens, right? Yeah, absolutely. And Preston Smith, man, he uh, – that's one, if I remember correctly, too, last year, Mike Wall was talking about that's, that's probably your defensive player of the year. At one point in the season, I remember him specifically saying that. Very underappreciated in the role he plays on this defense. No doubt about that. Just consistent, man, steady as they come, right? The mentor so- – you know, someone to set the someone to set the tone. Uh, you know, alongside Rashawn Gary, l- leading them into the off season, not afraid to speak up. You know, when when need be, and that's what I love about him. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Andy Monday in the chat says, Clayton, can you explain what option Green Bay has uh, with Clark's void years? Are they part of the guaranteed money of his current contract, or can they be included in an extension? The way that the way that voidable years works. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, and th- that's a problem too. There's there's a lot of loopholes and things with this cash over cap game that everybody's playing. If you have voidable years tacked on, right? What you're what you've done is that's guaranteed money that you've allocated to future years, right? Even though they're not on the roster. So if they leave the team, all of that. Let's. I don't have his contract pulled up. I could probably pull it up real quick. Let me do that just to just to make sure. Um, and I'll explain to you exactly what we mean about how those are going to accelerate to the current year um, and how the, all that works. Because it, it's it's more of a benefit if you keep them on the roster rather than just letting it accelerate forward. It really, it kind of acts as an option for the team, right? In case you do want to keep them around, okay, we can spread that out. But, again, if you decide to cut bait with them, then what's going to happen is all that money, that voidable years is going to accelerate. So let's see if we can kind of dive into it here just a touch. They're going to add us to death here, I'm sure. But So this is Kenny Clark's contract, right? We scroll down. It's the last year of his contract. So the cap hit this year um, is just off screen, of course. Let me see if I can widen this out for us just a touch here. Here we go. Look at this technological advancement. So the uh, the cap hit, if I remember correctly, <laughs> is going to be right here, okay? So your cap hit is $27.4 million. All right, that's your cap hit this year. 
Now you've got voidable years in 25, 26, and 27, meaning the cap hit with him, if you decide to extend him, there's still going to be $13.7 million in cap already on the books for him in 2025, right? So let's say you give him uh, a two-year extension. You can still move those voidable years or that that money around in those three voidable years you've got. But now let's say you give him a two-year extension. You've got two active years. You can pull that stuff back up. You can push it back. And that's why the guaranteed money is so important. But to answer your question, if we cut, if we do not re-sign him, what's going to happen is that 13-7, that 5-4, and that 2-7 all accelerates the current year. Okay. And that's going to equal this cap penalty we're talking about right here, right? It's where you got basically in cap penalty dead cap for 2025 or 2024 would be 24.2 million. Next year, all that's going to accelerate to 2025 salary cap. So that's why it makes a little more sense if you can resign them somehow, some way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously it's going to, it's going to take less, less guaranteed money to make that happen less of a cap hit, so it's reasonable. That's like with Aaron Jones. It To me, it did not make sense to not bring Aaron Jones back, especially seeing that they were within $2 million. I, I really don't want to continue to go over Aaron Jones, but it's, it's an important kind of case study for what we're talking about. They basically came in under $4 million on Aaron Jones. They said, no, we want you to restructure your salary all the way down to under $4 million. Well, Minnesota gave him $6 million. So essentially, we lost him for that $2 million, right? Now, granted, you're going to free up that money, however much money it was, $10 million or whatever it was. But again, you're, you're incurring that cap penalty as well, but you're going to be freeing up cap. So it's mm -hmm. you know, some people look at it like, ah, oh, the money's more important. Let's, let's, let's free up that money. And me, when it comes to cash over cap, especially with the cap jumping again, whatever it was, a record $30 million this year in, in cap space, it's like the goal is to have the best team on the field, you know, within reason. But again, you know, we don't want to chew our back or twice, but that this is kind of one of those similar situations. Do you want to incur that entire cap penalty and have that accelerate? Or do you want to have Kenny Clark back on the roster? Right. Now it's got to be a reasonable number. Um, right. You sign him back. You know, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if Kenny's willing to take a discount. He may um, typically what it does is they'll go and try to try to get an assessment of the market and determine, okay, is it worth it for us to test free agency or not? So, uh, but yeah, the perk of keeping him is you don't have to accelerate all that dead cap. The negative, if he does walk, is all that dead cap is going to accelerate to you. And we got more than enough cap space to, you know, to absorb it. It's just, it's not smart, right? Right. So. We want to go back. We want to go back to his earlier years. 2016, he was a 74, 8, 2017, 87, 3, 2018, 90.7, then dropped back down to a, a 79.5 in 2019. So that curve's kind of coming back down. He hit the low of the 66.4 in 2022, and he was a 70.4 last year. So we could sign him. Hopefully, you know, he gets a little bit more of climbing up that bell curve and then right back. You know, as the as the contract tapers off, but the exactly. the fact of you know the um the maturity he's been there eight years, he knows what what goes on in that locker room. He's he's seen uh you know it change hands. He's seen it change coaches. Uh, the dude yeah. has a lot of uh, things that he could pass on to the next generation. There, he's got that, the right. Attitude. No question. Yep, that's his defensive line, man. Mm -hmm. For sure. I, I mean, I've seen that firsthand at camp. Like he's he's the general of that. Uh, defensive line group for sure mm -hmm. um, well earned so, well earned yeah and uh full-on veteran leadership you know which is uh few and far between on a young football team you know we've got a few of those pieces uh here on both sides of the ball but you know in, they're kind of in the minority you know we're a really young football team that's no secret so kenny's a, a valuable piece on multiple levels for sure yeah definitely and, and just to kind of clarify that with you andy um Essentially, what you've got is in 2025, your cap hit is 5'4, five, 5'4, four, five, four, then 2'7. If you cut them out right, that's where the dead cap, or if you just let them walk, that's where the dead cap accelerates, and that total comes to 13.7. So he would be $13.7 million against the cap next year and not on the roster. Okay. So now you now where it comes into play is okay, what you're weighing out is do you want 13.7 and no Kenny Clark, or do you want Hey, let's give him a, a fifteen million dollar deal. Spread it out, you know, fifteen million per, and with the guaranteed, 
you know, if you do a two year deal, it's really a one year deal. You're going to incur a cap penalty at the end of the at the end of the road there. You know, after 2026, if you decide to move on from him. But now what you do is you start comparing this number here, the cap hit this year of twenty seven point four to whatever the difference would be once you or whatever the total would be when you add on the new contract cap hit to the thirteen point seven. Right. Or in this case, the five point four. Right. So that's why I say it makes more sense to try to extend them. So you can utilize that dead cap that's already there and continue to finagle. But some people would say, nope, cut bait, absorb the penalty, clean it off next year. I'm just not interested in having $60 million in cap space. I want a good football team. That's the way I see it as right. a Packers fan. So, and again, the, for those that are like, oh, nope, you can't keep them. You, we go through this every year. <laughs> you, you watch. When we get closer to August, the cap gurus, the gloom and doomers, will start, they'll start re-emerging. And it's, man – if, if if they do one or two contracts and decide to go cash over cap and kick it down the road a little bit, they're going to come right back out of their little troll caves and they're going to be complaining like the Packers are going under. And then the second, you know, my favorite this year was the one that that's always the worst at one of them. That's always the worst at it was all of a sudden like we got money this year. And it's like, why are you acting surprised? This happens every single year. But anyway, people fan how they want. You know what I mean? It's totally cool. But. That's hopefully that explained it there, Andy. Yeah, you're welcome, buddy. Anytime, man. Um, I love the cap stuff and I don't understand everything about it. I don't, I, I'm not even close. I just, yeah, one thing that I did realize is the league was shifting the cash over cap. You better dig in and try to understand it, especially if you're going to be talking about it a little bit, right? So, um, yeah, I think it's cool. Anytime business merges with sports, man, that's. That's the stuff that gets me fired up. I love that type of stuff. So um, let's see what else we had here real quick. I had a couple of things I want to hit on Brazil. So Rob Domofsky tweeted this out earlier. He says, based on the Packers president, Mark Murphy's comments this morning, it sounds like they're preparing to open the season in Brazil against the Eagles. Speaking before the annual tailgate tour departed, Murphy said, quote, we're either the first or second most popular team in Brazil. He went on to say, Rob Domofsky went on to say, the Packers expect an announcement any day now. More Murphy, quote, also, this is very important for our league. If we're chosen, we'll gladly go. Many people are reading the tea leaves and saying, this means the Packers are going to Brazil. Tim, I see you shaking your head, and I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but do you think they're going to Brazil? Well, man? It sounds it sounds like it. I mean, Mark's walking back the, the comments he made you know, <laughs> last time about we don't want to bust down in Milwaukee and jump on an airplane and, you know, the logistically. Isn't long enough. <laughs> yeah, you know, logistically it's kind of a nightmare. And maybe he knows, you know, obviously he knows something we don't. Maybe, uh, you know, it certainly is, you know, between the Packers and maybe one other team at this point. So maybe it's looking like we're going to go and they're trying to get their, you know, their heads around that and ready to go. And, you know, to open the season, why not? Let's do it. Get As far as I'm concerned, get the get the international play over with right away. Get back back home to what we're used to and and move on with your season. Um, we all saw how, you know the trip across the pond to London did for us, uh, didn't, didn't work out too well. So, um, you know, hopefully if we do in fact have to travel, uh, it is early in the season, you know, kick off the year, but, um, I think he's right. It's great for the sport. Uh, there are a ton of Packer fans in Brazil. Uh, oh, yeah. we are very well represented in Brazil. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, man. Yeah, I think everybody, it was pretty universal that everyone kind of took those comments. Like, it's sounding like they're trying to get the Packers to. It's like the yeah. league's going, you don't have to, but we're going to. Oh, we're going to be really disappointed if you don't. Yeah, we're going to. It reminds me of, a, you know, a quote that Mandy says to me all the time. Do what you want, Clayton. You're going to anyway. And it's like, <laughs> damn, girl, really? You going that route? <laughs> so, but yeah, it just seems like the league's like, okay, you don't have to go if you don't want to. So do you want to go? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Until they say, yeah. Uh, Coach Lynn said it'll probably happen. The comment says it all. Mm -hmm. um, United Bates uh, says Brazil is probably safer than Lincoln Financial Field. To be yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to put that one up there. Yeah, let's go. That, that's and, and that's I hilarious. Think a good point, though. It's an away game for the Packers and a home game for the Eagles. Mm -hmm. Right. So the – when you look at it, yes, it's a competitive disadvantage to have to fly down there from the rest of the league standpoint, but both teams have to fly down there. Okay, so there's no disadvantage there, right? Now think about this. Where would you rather play? A mutual site 
right? A neutral side, I should say, a neutral side where there's probably going to be a large majority of Packer fans or play it the link or the stink, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and have them have that true home field advantage from that point. I feel the same way about this that I felt about going to London. And I know London didn't work out for the Packers, but for those Packer fans in other countries that never get to experience what we get to experience, I want it for them, man. Cause they're just the diehard fans, man. So I just hope that they have the, uh, the, the beer vendors are better prepared than uh, they were in London. Um, You know, Packer fans, drank London out of beer very quickly. That's right. <laughs> they actually did a few stories on that, how the they were basically out of beer <laughs> within wild. like the first day or so. So um, hopefully right they'll, uh, they'll have it flowing down there in Brazil for sure. <laughs> right. And and think about how much that's going to test the young team because none of these, none of these guys were on that. I mean, well, it's obviously some were, but none of the rookies uh, then Christian Watson was or wasn't. I'm trying to remember. It's two years ago. I can't remember. Yeah. So yeah, I so, mean, it's yeah. a it's going to be a big test. Those guys, yeah, right. It'll be a huge test for the young team. And if Matt can get him out of the way, get it over with at the first game of the season. Hey, you know we're going to go through practice. We'll have preseason. We're going to get a couple games under our belt. All right, let's fly out, get this over with, and get back to yeah. our season. Because what a shocker! The Packers start another season on the road. I mean, mm-hmm. one of these one of these days we'll get a home game to start Week One. Keep it going. Some, sometime. These guys in the chat here. AFAM says, I've met zero Packer fans from Brazil. <laughs> Paul Robertson says, you can't even find Brazil on a map, AFAM. And AFAM <laughs> says, yeah, it's next to Yugoslavia. <laughs> <laughs> God, I love you the chat, sure man. About that? Oh, dude. Um, so, all right, let's uh, let's move it along here. we got a couple other things to hit on. You guys remember last night we talked about Jaden Daniels and Malik Neighbors' comments. First of all, I love Jaden Daniels' demeanor. Like the way he was just like, you really going? You're doing? You know, Malik Neighbors is very outgoing, very outspoken, and Jaden Daniels seems a little bit more, you know, reserved. But he was hinting at them being able to play together, right, and linking up with an old homie, I think is what he said. And, you know, I had kind of proposed, you know, Chicago's got two early picks. Are they hinting that maybe Jaden Daniels might go to Chicago? But also, you know, Brian Kelly, who's the head coach of the LSU Tigers, um, my family. Have you guys heard that sound bite, by the way? We need that on the show. Have you ever heard that? Okay. Uh, you know, I'm a Notre Dame fan. Brian Kelly is Irish, okay? He is as Irish as they come, and he coached at Notre Dame for a long time, right? So he's got this very brash kind of sharp accent, you know, like, like someone from the Northeast would have, you know, who's Irish. He goes down there to LSU, gets the job, and within the first week, they bring him out to mid-court, to, to half-court at a basketball game to address the fans. And he had a Southern accent all of a sudden, bro. It, <laughs> it's the most cringe thing you will ever hear. Dude. almost reminds me of a politician. Uh, uh, you know, oh. <laughs> I won't name any names, but we all know who I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over here snorting. Uh, uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Anyways, um, he said, I'm just so happy to be down here with my family. And everybody went, when the hell did he start talking like that? It was just the fakest country accent you ever heard, man. It was hilarious. So anyway, he said that, Jay, that was a long, long roundabout to get to the point right here. We got politics involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> but Jaden Daniels, he said that Jaden Daniels was going number two to Washington is basically what Brian Kelly said. Right. So Jake Shavink actually commented on the YouTube page here and said, I do think neighbors means Washington, not Chicago. I think his old homie is Brandon Ayuk. They played together at Arizona State and Ayuk gets moved to Washington to pair with Daniels. Now, to the best of my knowledge, that trade hasn't happened and maybe there have been significant trade talks. I've just missed it. But that right there makes a whole lot more sense, obviously, than Chicago does, right? So um, that would be interesting, though. These are all the draft stories that's going to really shape everything up there in the first round. It's going to be just an absolute blast on draft mm-hmm. night for sure. But uh, just wanted to kind of point that out that Jake kind of mentioned that. Another thing, too, Jeremiah Trotter Jr.'s pro day was today. 
I haven't seen any numbers released yet. If anybody in the chat has, comment it. Maybe we can get them in here. But to the best of my knowledge, they haven't uh, put anything out yet. But uh, this this tweet came out from at Chapel Fowler said, uh, no time released yet, but looks like former Clemson linebacker Jeremiah Charter Jr. ran the 40-yard dash for NFL teams and did other drills at a private workout on campus today. He was set to run 40 at the pro day last month, but didn't due to a nagging hamstring. So he looks looks healthy there to me. You know, obviously, I'm eager to see what the measurables are because his RAS is going to take a big hit because of the size. We've talked about that. But like we also pointed out as well, he could play Will in the 4-3 because we we highlighted the 4-3 defense of San Francisco. We highlighted the 4-3 defense of the New York Jets, and they both – had Will backers that were right around 5'10", 5'11", one of which is Quentin Williams, or I'm sorry, Quincy Williams, who was just a stud, stud Will backer last year. So just something to kind of keep an eye on there. We should have those numbers here really, really soon. So uh, here's uh, Jake Shavink in the chat, wrapping it back around to Washington. So Washington has a lot of capital for I-2. They, uh, they've got the 36th pick, the 40th pick, the 67th pick, et cetera. So they definitely got the firepower to make that happen to get Brandon Ayuk over to Washington. And uh, honestly, the way that San Francisco's offense is kind of shaped up and they like to run a, a lot of 21 and 12 looks, really really that's a position they could probably afford to get rid of right now too, unfortunately. So there you go. Um, but, yeah, so Jeremiah Trotter Jr., I'm eager to see what those numbers are. And again, on my board, I'm trying to remember exactly where I got it. Let me share my board up here one more time. Um, Because, again, at one point he was my favorite linebacker. But on down the road, uh, obviously he he had continued to drop. Now, this was before my board was created when he was one of, if not the top-ranked linebackers in this year's draft. But right now on my board, as far as linebacker, I got Junior Colson at 52, Peyton Wilson at 60, Cedric Gray at 64, and then Jeremiah Trotter Jr. in the 77th spot. And you see with his PFF numbers, I don't know if you got them pulled up or not, Emilio. Um, yeah, yeah what, what do you got on Jeremiah Trotter Jr. for 2022, 2023? 2022 is 86-9, and 2023 was 85-7 with 680 snaps in both of them. Just an absolute stud, man. And here's what's crazy. Like, obviously the PFF numbers both in 22 and 23 help him out tremendously. On the consensus big board, when I took the information down, he had already dropped to 54, so that hurt him a little bit compared to the other two rankings. But the other thing, the 33rd team has him in the 138 spot. So if you remove the 38, the 33rd team's ranking there, he's probably jumping into the top 50, maybe even the top 40 on my board. But again, I'm going to include those rankings because I got a lot of, I don't know, a lot of respect for that that site, that publication when it comes to the draft prospect process, uh, process as far as grading them. So. Um, going to be interesting to see where he goes. Tim, what do you think, man? Do you think somebody surprised? Let's say, let's say Jeremiah Trotter Jr. lights up everything other than the size as far as RAS, and he checks all the boxes, right? Let's say he did the agility drill. Let's say he did the broad jump, the vertical, the 40, everything, and everything came out in the nines other than the size. Do you think there's a chance that he jumps close to the first round, or do you think 77 is probably about where he'll be, uh, be listed? I think he'll, I think it's pretty accurate. I don't I don't see him jumping to the first round, but you know, which probably means that's exactly what'll happen because usually <laughs> right. when I say something it's it's the opposite. But um no, I think um, you know, where he's at is pretty close to where he's gonna gonna end up. Um, you know, and he could he could end up a Packer. I mean we don't know um if Goody's gonna take a linebacker, uh, and we don't know how early i wouldn't think it would be in the early rounds if he does so you know perhaps uh we do get a guy like jeremiah trotter jr here in green bay um if there's value and he's on the board when we're picking but i don't see him making super huge leaps uh, on the list as we get closer to the draft here lincoln, so lincoln agrees he, with me right <laughs> agree. Agree. You know. he heard something downstairs you're standing at the steps for about 45 seconds i'm like any second now you're gonna let it go <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so as far as our draft picks, you know, again, I've got him in the 77 spot, but we've got the uh, the 58th pick, the 88th pick, the 91st pick. Um, there's a chance he drops to 88. Um, 58 might be a little too high, you know what I mean, Emilio? So he's kind of right. riding between where we're picking. But, again, it doesn't matter where we're picking. It doesn't matter what my board says. If Goody 
Goody has a, a first round grade on him, they'll take him, right? I yeah. just I have a hard time believing he does. I'm just kind of holding out hope that he does. So, what do you think about Trotter, man? Uh, PFF has him 88 on their board, and it looks like Draft Buzz has him at 67. Um, <laughs> so 88, 67. I've got him at 77. Yep, right in the middle, right? Yep. He <laughs> in at uh, you know, six foot two twenty eight. His forty was a four six with hands. I mean, the the dude was you know kind of low in the measurables, but I, I think kind of going back to it, it was STN forty was saying we we talked about it. McDuffie has already been in at the mic. You know, why are we gonna why are we gonna take a guy right out of college and have him stick his stick his nose in there to try to you know stop Myers all all summer? I don't. I mean, I don't know if he's gonna love that, right? So. Why wouldn't you maybe, you know, let McDuffie go? He already knows how Quay works. They, they, you know, they they could make it happen. Let's pick someone that we can, um, you know, work on, you get him better, set him up to be a wheel, whatever, um, and then go from there. I would feel a little bit more comfortable about that, but I don't think that um, Goody would have a problem pulling the trigger. We've seen it with Quay. If if he has a grade on the dude that he thinks he's elite, he's going to take him regardless of the pick. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm with you, Emilio. I think uh, I think Zay McDuffie's like the one true mic we have right now, and 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 it feels like it's kind of just like coming around, right? It, it's taken us like these past three months to mm-hmm. say, no, we need a linebacker, we need a linebacker, we need a mic, we need a we, and it's like, dude, we have we we kind of have Zay right on right on the team. What do we? Him and Quay have played bang bang together. They've they've yep. they've run nickel together. They know how to. They know how each other's brain kind of works. They've been in practice. They've been through drills. So yep. we're going to take someone fresh out of college and slap them in there at the mic, put a green dot on them and everything. I, you know, I don't know about that. So I, I think it's kind of just coming full circle where we're seeing it, you know, with a clear, clear view now. Definitely. And just to clarify, if we remove the 33rd team aspect of my board, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. would jump all the way to the 24 spot on my board. So, and again, why is he so low on the 33rd team? I guarantee it's the size, right? That's the main thing. So, um, but like Mike Wall said, that his dad was a bad man, right? So, I, if, if he's got that kind of dog mentality, I wouldn't be opposed to it, man. If you're going to bring that kind of heat, if you're going to play with that kind of attitude, I'm all about it. But I, I, I need to see it a little bit more. I, I need to have, I need to know that the Packers have confidence in you, regardless of what anybody else thinks here, there, or anywhere. Yeah, definitely. Last one I wanted to get here. This came in from Ron Samble in our Patreon group. And, guys, if you uh, are interested in joining the PTA Posse there on Patreon, um, we're going to be giving away an autographed Paul Horning jersey on uh, round one, during round one, not one of the draft. Um, just we're going to be throwing everyone who's in the Patreon group into that drawing. Um, again, there's a link in the description of this video that will send you to our Patreon group. That's where Ron is right here. We have some really good conversations in there, just throwing ideas back and forth. And we're kind of utilizing it as almost like a super chat. We want to prioritize those uh, in the uh, in the Patreon group for sure. Ron Sample says, where is Cole Bishop on your board, Clayton? I haven't heard his name too much. I'm wondering what is keeping him from being a top safety um, for the Packers. Now, people, there's some people that love Cole Bishop. One of those people is Greg Cosell. Now, if you look on my board right here, I've got him in the 158 spot, okay? Now, some people are going, why are you having so low? First of all, you see the minus five here. That's the Greg Cosell bonus, right, uh, right here. So Greg Cosell was just raving about him. I mean, it, when you when you heard Greg talk about him, it was almost like he, he was like this was his favorite safety in the draft. He didn't come out and say that specifically, but it kind of felt that way. He was like, this guy can play in quarters. He can play in a too high shell. He can he can play split. He can play. Uh, middle field, uh, middle field close that deep safety, the post safety. He can play in the box. He can blitz. Like he said, and I guess he's seen something on tape, Emilio, mm-hmm. that he just absolutely loved. Now on my board, he's one fifty eight. The reason he's one fifty eight. Last year's PFF, if I remember correctly, was just absolute booty cheeks. What was his twenty twenty three PFF grade for Cole Bishop? Let me see if I can it just logged me on one sec. I was pulling him up on Draft Buzz. They have him at one oh four. Okay. And with a position ranking of 24 out of, I think it's out of all DBs, he would be 24th. So that's, I mean, the dude, it, it it's crazy. We've talked about it. how, how can people have such different takes on dude is going to be a top, you know, once first or second safety off the board, or he's going to get taken day three. Like, what are we talking about, man? There's such a big spectrum there. It's true. 
I've got I've got a lot of Paul Bullard, your guy DDT, and uh, Jaden Hicks all over Cole Bishop oh, yeah. online. Yeah, they have they on PFF they have they have Vaki above Cole Bishop. Cole Bishop is 120 on PFF with his grades being 2021 20, was a 628, 22 was a 755, and 23 was a 656. Hmm. So. Yeah, so it's nice to know I'm not the I'm not the only one out here in these waters, right? Everybody's kind of all over the place with him. Um, as far as this PFF grade, I'd like to see what it is. Um, let me see if I can get logged in real quick. It was a, oh, it's a sixty-five six it's for twenty twenty-three. Yeah, so that's that's why he had such a low number on mine right there. If you were to remove that now in twenty twenty-two, I've got a one thirty-nine on him. Was he to right around the hundred and thirty-ninth ranked uh, safety in twenty twenty-two? Am I thinking right? Was yep seventy five five. There you go. So played played quite a bit better in twenty twenty two than twenenty twenty three, but that drags his grade down. The consensus big board at the time had him ninety seventh, mm-hmm. and the thirty third team pretty high on him seventy fourth. Right, so that's where he comes in for me. Now he absolutely crushed the uh, RAS right, the combine, wow. whether it's the combine or the pro day. You know he finished in the nines, I believe, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. So thirty third team has him third um, overall safety. Yeah, there so you yeah, go. they're high at him. Definitely. So one of those guys that we might see come off the board early, he may be sticking around to the to the fourth or fifth round. Yeah, right? or he's a or he's a Jaden Reed kind of guy and everyone moves yeah. back. The thing that's gonna the thing that's gonna bring him up is is was the combine, but you know, because right. Jaden Reed didn't test as well and he was, you know, kind of the hidden gem. But yeah. uh, just on the physicals though, he fits the build. Six two, two oh five, you know, size, there, there's a lot of five eleven you know, 180, 85, 190 yep. guys in this yep. group too. So, you know, including, you know, even like Malik Mustafa, who's one of my kind of, I, I wouldn't call him a sleeper, but he's someone I'm had my eye on, but he's a little on the shorter size himself too. So, you know, you look at guys like, um, you know, like, yeah, a lot of Poe Hicks and Bishop they're they're more in their NFL body, you know, body type at that position. You know, you got to be able to, to make those tackles and make those hits, you know, you got big NFL tight ends and receivers coming at you. So definitely SDM 40 in the chat says he and Mike wall said, who's 33rd team anyway. Who in the hell is Mel Kuyper in a way? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I'm saying. That's hilarious, man. All right. oh. so we got through the prospects that were asked about. I apologize for the dogs, guys. He, uh, it's hard for me to tell. That. He looks at me with those big brown eyes. I'm like, come on in here, boy. Mm-hmm. Come in here and grab a seat. So I can't wait for you to meet Lincoln. You Put love him me. on the co-host cam. We got the, the co-host cam fired up. <laughs> right now you'll just be able to see his, his rear end because he's staring down the steps right now. <laughs> let's, see. Let's, see if it's, uh, let's see if we can pull that off real quick. He's still standing there. <laughs> now you can't see him. He's out of range. He's just out uh, of range. If he comes back in, though, let's see if he walks by right here. He might walk by. No, nah. Link. Watch right here, Link. Oh, he's oh, there. there Link, oh. See the ear. You see the ear. Oh, there he is. <laughs> There's the sister. Oh, hey, he's... Here. can you look right here, man? There he is. That's yeah, guy. yeah, Link. Yeah, I can't wait for you to meet him, Emilio. He's, he'll, he's a sweetheart, man. He's he'll, gonna fill the frame next year. Dude's bro, gonna you, walk in front of the camera and just be. Yeah. <laughs> he's gonna walk on camera and be like, "I'm the mic linebacker." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna walk in the house to see him the first time and go, "Whoa!" And then after two minutes, he'll be in your lap. But he thinks he's uh-huh. gonna wall walk. He weighs. I don't know. He probably weighs about a buck twenty three right now. He'll be the lap dog for the draft. We'll just be running the boards. No doubt. I'll end up doing everything myself, and Emilio will be out on the deck with uh with Lincoln <laughs> with a fire built out here in the fire pit. That's what will happen. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right. Good deal. What else do we got here? I'm trying to figure out what Doug's talking about. Doug said, Clayton, what did you make of Wall's question? What question was that, Doug? Um, trying to think what he asked. <laughs> what do you think he's talking about there, Emilio? Uh, I, I he maybe, from, maybe he asking from, about the 33rd team, but I, I'm not exactly sure. He has some colorful commentary, dude. I was cracking up. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah, and it, oh, well. I love how he just sent it. And he, he, yeah, he's not going to be about the 33rd yeah, 33 team. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He, he said essentially the way I took from it was like, okay, there's something he doesn't like about the 33rd team. And then when I asked him, he went, I don't know. I'm just, you know, <laughs> that's my <laughs> wall. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and then after that, I said, well, the reason I like them is because they've got, you know, uh, 
their their website. They've got people that have been in and around the game, former coaches, former executives, and he stuck that chest up. <laughs> if you, anybody was watching, like, oh, really? Like who? You know, it was, it was kind of the approach. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, let me stop this real quick, and I'll see if I can share the thirty thirteen because I'll show you guys what I'm talking about. And I, again, I didn't have the heart to say it, and it may not even mean anything to him too. Like here, first article right here, right? Yeah. As I show it up here, how, learn how NFL evaluators grade players. This is by Bill Parcells. So when you talk about the people that are on their uh, on their staff there, right? Or let me go to uh, experts. Actually, when I said former coaches, he said also oh, a bunch of people that that got ran out of the league, basically, you know, and they're, they're not good coaches. I didn't have the heart to say, no, it's not that. Cause you got hall of fame coach, Bill Parcells, right? You got Marvin Lewis, Super Bowl champion, right? Coach Wade Phillips, absolute legend, Super Bowl champion coach, Mike Martz, Super Bowl champion coach. <laughs> I was like, I don't have the, it's like, he thought there were like a bunch of just random, you know what I mean? Coaches. Right. And if you go to the, uh, if you go to the front office, right. You've got uh, Mike Tannenbaum, who was with the Jets. Obviously, you could say he wasn't a good GM. Got it. Bill Polin got inducted into the Hall of Fame. He was the one who basically organized and orchestrated the entire Indianas- Indianapolis Coats uh, dynasty there, right? So that's uh, that's why I'm big on it. And the other thing, too, is like players, Fred Warner, right? Mm-hmm. The best Mike linebacker in the NFL right now, right? He's contributing. Um, Amon yeah. Ron State Brown, one of the up-and-comer wide receivers. Right, huge. Ron and and Hall of Fame. We're not beating on Mike. And we're not no. beating on Mike at all. He, he might not even know. Like he might, like I think Doug was saying, he might not even know. He didn't know. Right? He, was, like, he was even on it, right? So it doesn't even. You may see his broadcast next, and he's using it, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly, right. So yeah, it's almost so, like he played football with this guy. I got some advice for y'all. Take two weeks off, then quit. <laughs> <laughs> see, so yeah, that's uh. Again, that's that's why I, I use utilize the 3013. Um again, I know there's some people out there that that really enjoy like kind of coming up with their own grades and coming up with their, you know, hey, I you know, you'll hear me watch the tape. I don't watch the tape to go, this guy's good or this guy's bad. I watch it more from a schematic standpoint of here's what they're trying to do, right? Here was the play call, here's where it went right, here's where it went wrong. I'm not the one to go. Oh, that dude's got bad technique. I've never played. I've never played at the NFL level, right? Like I, ain't, I'm not going to sit there and pretend like I understand that stuff. To me, honestly, it's cringy when people do that. And and again, I don't go over on a Twitter page and go, "Hey, this is cringy, bro." Um, I just kind of keep to myself and not make a comment. But I just I don't feel confident m- enough in my ability to to break down prospects and go, "Okay, here's the strength, here's the weakness." I would rather utilize you know other people who have. Uh, kind of come come before them and, and understand the game. So, um, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, Michael in the chat says, LOL, ironically, Bill Belichick just got fired and has had some questionable drafts lately. You know, it's funny you say that, Michael, because if you watch the Dynasty documentary, everything paints this picture like Bill was the problem. And, you know, many people around the league are saying they had bad drafts. Look at all the players the Patriots just re-signed. Everybody from those bad drafts, they're re-signing them. It's like out of, out of the one side of their mouth, they're going, man, Belichick just got really bad at drafting. Oh, by the way, let's throw the checkbook at them. Mm-hmm. We want them back, you know. So it just depends on kind of, yeah, which side you're on there. But the thing about Belichick, too, and, Mar- and uh, he actually pointed out today, Mike Wall did, he said, uh, you know, he, he thinks that more players – need to be coaching more former players need to be coaching right he mentioned that um and he went on to talk about why it was a good thing that that players were you know morphed into coaches and i i'm sitting there as he's talking and i'm like dan campbell in detroit former player got the got the lions cranking right now right the miko ryan's former player got the texans cranking right now right so it's paying off for sure but uh he also pointed out bill belichick never played a snap in the nfl and he's got you know, the best resume of anyone. So there you go. Anything else you guys want to hit on, Tim, other than this right here, my man? Happy birthday, Curly. Mm-hmm. The GOAT. Salute. Had to find yeah. a, one of the old school pictures. Eight, there. 1898 that it was born today. Yeah, wow. Unbelievable. How old were you in 1898, Amelia? <laughs> 
<laughs> you weren't a twinkle in your great great no, great grandfather's yeah, eye. Yeah, that's the truth. I was I was probably over in Italy or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, yeah, throwing some throwing some yeah. dough. Uh -huh. <laughs> I love it, Absolutely. <laughs> A little bit of prosciutto, you know. <laughs> and there's nothing better than Italian food, man. Tim, you a big Italian food guy? Oh, of course. Of course. It's my favorite, man. I'm just telling you. You get some good Italian. Woo! Let's go. Mm -hmm. We got a place here in town called Bella Vita. And a buddy of mine, his name's Amel, runs it. And it, his dad started the, started the restaurant, and then he passed away several years ago and uh, left it to his sons. And Amel runs it, man. I'm telling you, it's it's authentic Italian. It's so good, dude. It's so good. So, what are you giggling about over there, Amelia? He's thinking about some chicken parmesan, right? Yeah, so it's like yeah. right here, right? A couple of cutlets, something, man. A couple of cutlets. <laughs> yeah. Some Johnny, more, yeah. What was his name? Tommy <laughs> Cutlets. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what a wild season it was, man. Yeah. Here you go. Eric Sutherland says, Pizza Hut is an Italian. Sorry, Amelia. Sorry. Sorry. You're right, Eric. You're right. Olive Garden, though. Let me tell you. Don't stop when you're <laughs> drinking that parm out. That, that whole block is going in my bowl. Mark Zambito said that Emilio is racist <laughs> towards other Italians. Yeah. <laughs> How does that even make sense? Take it out. SDM40 said the real Italian food is SpaghettiOs. Ooh. So, there you go. Don't you say, well, that stuff is disgusting, bro. <laughs> <laughs> About cussed. Whew. All right, that's how you get through here. college. Spaghettios <laughs> and ramen is how you get through college. There's nothing better. We're sitting here talking about spaghettios with Curly Lambo's picture on the screen. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> hey, Curly. So, anyways, happy birthday to the founder of the Packers. Yes, yeah. thank you for thank you for the football team, Curly. <laughs> and you know, contrary to popular belief, there uh, Curly was not Italian. Okay, he was not. So, yeah, y'all got anything else, boys? Negative. We'll be talking about SpaghettiOs at the hour 11 minute mark. What is yeah. going on right now? <laughs> hey, we Roadhouse. Cleaned it up a lot sooner. <laughs> Not that video, but we've got this <laughs> other video here that I want to show. You know, Latu, um, we'll wrap it up with this real quick. Latu is red on my board. He's in the number nine spot. Hands down the best edge defender in this draft, I believe. Um, him and Chop Robinson are right there toward the top on my board. But he's dealing with the neck injury, right? And And – you know, his camp says he's good to go, but Daniel Jeremiah said the rumor is 18 to 20 teams will be taking him off their first round board, which means he's going to drop for medical purposes. Look at him working out today. Look how smooth this dude is. Watch this next drill right here. Look at this one. When he dips under, look at this. Like, I don't know, man. I, I watched that and I'm like, I, I, Gary Rush is different. He's more of a power rusher. Look how smooth that is, dude. Mm -hmm. That guy's probably going to fall to someone like Baltimore in the first round. And they're going to go, you know what? We'll take a flyer on with the neck. And he's probably going to go on to play 10 years and just be absolutely elite. I wouldn't be surprised one bit. So who knows, man? Maybe that's uh, on the Packers' radar, too. You get someone that otherwise would have been a top tier guy in the entire draft. And drafting me, you got another edge for the future. You can never have too many uh, pass rushers. That's for sure. If he falls to Goody, Goody probably pulls the trigger. If he falls to 25. It'd be hard to pass up on him, man. Yeah. It would. And, again, 18 to 20 teams taking them off their first-round board. I mean, I'm no mathematician here or a rocket scientist, but 25 is outside of that 18 to 20. You know what I'm saying? So, you with me, Emilio? Yeah. No, I was laughing at Eric. What would he say? Got a neck like a chicken. <laughs> We're out of here. Uh, Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, it looks like Blake Martinez, this guy said. United oh Bates is Pokemon? <laughs> yeah, we, we hear you, Mark. We hear you, bud. Darius is on the board. But PFF's yeah. got him at, PFF's got him at Darius Robinson. Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> He's in the 46 spot on my board, big dog. 44 on PFF. There you go. 44 on PFF, 46 on mine. The only thing that pulled him down a touch was his 2022 PFF grade, which wasn't horrible. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, if, it, if it hadn't been for that, uh, in the early consensus big board, he'd probably be somewhere in the top 30. I like how he got better each year. Went from a 68 to a 77 to an 83. Yeah, very versatile. We hate you too, Mark. But I just wanted to. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, very versatile. People were saying he comps to J.J. Watt, which perked my ears up a lot. I know Jake had a lot to say about him coming back from 
senior uh, the senior bowl too. So you, these Missouri guys, man, Missouri guys, they had a, season, they had a team, man. Yeah, D- Darius Robinson. I would not be surprised if he jumps into the top twenty, top fifteen. That wouldn't surprise me one bit if somebody takes him up there. He's got that kind of upside. So, um, for me, that's a bit rich. Or as Ricky Bobby said, I'm too drunk to taste this chicken. You know what I'm saying? So, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody falls in love with him because he is a physical specimen, no doubt. He can play everywhere on the off on the defensive line. You can play him at outside linebacker at 296 pounds. Um, trim him down a little bit, throw him at a 34 uh, outside linebacker. You could, it, to me, it'd be an ideal Sam in a 34 front, that strong side outside linebacker, think Rashawn Gary, I think he would dominate if you, you know, trim 15, 20 pounds off of him. But he's probably going to fit more of a versatile role in a 4-3 front, kind of like J.J. Watt did. One second he's playing a wide seven tech. Next time he's in a three tech, just all over the defensive line. Mm-hmm. So let's get out of here before I get divorced. All right, I could talk <laughs> to you all night long. Appreciate you all. Uh, Tim, Emilio, thank you all for hanging out. Jacob's that out somewhere. Possum in a dumpster. That's exactly what he <laughs> <doing. laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, we're out of here. Appreciate everybody hanging out with us again. A special shout out to the Patreon uh, folks. Appreciate the questions. Y'all keep them coming. It's a lot of fun interacting with you guys and gals on there for sure. So um, we will see you tomorrow for PTA live tomorrow evening. And uh, what is tomorrow? It is Wednesday. Mm-hmm. So Wednesday, the 10th. Listen on the pod. Exactly. Jacob, he's here in spirit. <laughs> we Roughly what? Two tomorrow will be what? Am I thinking right? A little over two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go, man. We made it, boys. We made it. All this information is going to come piling in now. Somebody's going to get caught smoking dope in a a gas mask, and there's going to be things that shuffle the board down. All that stuff's going to happen. Trust me, it's on its way. (laughs) But uh, we'll be right here every step of the way. I'm I'm excited to see who the next uh, batch of Green Bay Packers are going to be. Gentlemen, what brings me to my next point? (laughs) Don't smoke crack. (laughs) <laughs> LT was some words of wisdom right there. So, and we got parting advice for everyone in the house. Tonight. Wash your hands, wash your butt, man. That's it. That's, that's all. <laughs> We're out. Y'all have a great Wednesday, and we will see you tomorrow evening. Go, Pat, go. The power sweep. Actually, it's the, it's the lead play in our, in our offense. We ask a YN or a tight end to open up somewhere between six feet and nine feet. Get an isolation with the with the linebacker. You tell the tackle, you take the defensive end if he's over him. If he's not, you drive down on the first man to his inside. If the YN has the linebacker taken out, he cuts inside. If the YN has the linebacker here, he comes all the way around. If you look at this play, what we're trying to get is a seal here and a seal here. And try to run this play in the alley.